people want to know. They want to know what's, what the future holds. In our text this morning, the disciples have expressed their interest in the future. They said to Jesus, tell us when all these things will be. And will there be a sign that all these things will be fulfilled? Now, Jesus had been talking to the disciples about the future. He spoke to them about the destruction of the temple. And so when they asked about when this would happen, Jesus, instead of talking about the temple, he talked to them about the tribulation instead. He described to them what the future would be like, not only for them, but for all people. He told them that it would be like what it would be like when he comes. And he says that he will come for the saints first. And that is all believers, the Christians. And then he will come again for the second time for or again with his saints. The event of his coming for believers is called the rapture. Many of us have heard that word used many times. But when he comes again, he will come with the believers. And that is called the revelation. These two comings of our Lord are separated by a period of seven years. Some people would like to debate that, but in my own study, it says seven years. And seven years between the rapture and the revelation, which is called the tribulation. Now the first time that Jesus will come, he'll come very privately. He'll come and he'll take the saints with him. And only the saints will see him. The second time he comes, it will be public. And every eye will see him. He comes, first of all, as a thief in the night. And the next time he comes, he will come as King of kings and Lord of lords. And both all these appearances are recorded in our text this morning. What I'd like to do is for us to look at these returns. The period of time between them, as I said, is called the tribulation. Jesus describes the signs of the tribulation's coming. If you look at verses 5 to 8, Jesus describes what it will be like before the tribulation actually occurs. And he gives us certain indicators of when the tribulation would come on earth. So look at Mark 13, verses 28 to 29. He says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth fruit, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is at the doors. And then he says that one would know when these things were about to happen as far as his coming. And he illustrated this by saying that just as one sees the leaves beginning to bud on the fig tree, one would know that summer was getting close. And so when one begins to see certain things happening, it is an indication that the fulfillment of things he described is getting close. Then he says, but of that day and that hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now we may not know the exact hour, but Jesus did say that we would know the approximate time of his coming and the events that would follow. But please know this, for all those individuals that like to predict the future, that what I just said dates, that only God the Father knows the exact moment of Jesus coming. No one can set the date, no one can predict the day, but we can know that His coming is drawing near. And Jesus described the indicators that the fulfillment of these things were drawing near. He said, first of all, that it will be a time of deception. And Jesus answering them began to say, take heed, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. Jesus predicted that there would be many that would claim to be the Christ. Do you know that just within the past 50 years, there have been over 1,100 different individuals who have claimed to be the Messiah. Jesus also said that it would be a time of disruption. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be troubled. For such things must happen, 
But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And you know, one of the most interesting things to know about this. Do you know that within the past 4,000 years, we've only had 268 years of peace. It has been further recorded and calculated that there have been 14,530 so-called wars. And since World War II, please think of this, since World War II, over 440 major wars have been fought. Today, right now, in our present time, one out of four nations are engaged in some kind of military conflict. Jesus further said that it would be a time of destruction. Let me read to you the rest of verse 8. And then there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. There was one, there was a study made just looking at the 14th century. How accurate it is, I really don't know. But they said that in the 14th century, there were 137 earthquakes. But here's the other interesting thing, that every century since that time, the number of earthquakes have increased. And in the 20th century, there have been over 2,300 major earthquakes. And do you know that in this world in which we live right now, approximately 2 billion people go hungry every day. And that it takes to feed these 2 billion hungry people approximately 1.2 billion metric tons of grain just to meet their minimum standards. And then when you think about the population explosion, when you think about disasters that may take place, whether it's natural or man-made, you understand that the hunger problem is only being compounded. But I have to say this, none of these things are new. They've been happening for centuries. But the key to understanding what Jesus was saying must be found in the statement that he makes when he says this. These are the beginning of sorrows. And the word sorrow here describes the birth pain, the birth pains, such as when a woman is in labor. And that pain begins to increase and increase in intensity prior to the mother giving birth. Well, all throughout history, such happenings have increased and intensified each year. And as they occur, as they occur, they, they inform us of the period of time known as the tribulation is getting nearer and nearer, and they make us even more aware that the Lord's coming is near. The second point that I'd like to make is that the sorrows of the tribulation, what it will mean, what happens? Jesus said the beginnings of sorrow. He spoke of the beginning of the tribulation of earth. But you've got to know this. He did say this, that the believers, the saints, Christians, those who have come to faith in Christ prior to that time will be taken out of the world. And that's why they call it the rapture. But on earth now begins something unprecedented. A time of, of sorrow, and grief, and pain that the world has never experienced before. We read in the, these words from Mark. For in those days there will be tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the creation which God created un until this time, nor ever will be. And unless, unless the Lord had shortened these days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. It will also be a time of personal sorrows, persecution, has always been a part of our Christian history. Christians have always understood that part of their faith experience would come with the possibility of persecution. Un throughout our history, our Christian history, untold millions have given their lives to remain 
Christ. Christians have never, ever been a stranger to persecution of one kind or another. And yet, there has been no time in history that will compare to this period of time. For during the tribulation, a large number of Jews, the Bible tells us, will come and receive Christ as Savior. Revelation 7 also tells us that there will be multitudes of Gentiles, in other words, those who are, who are not Jews, that cannot be numbered, that will come to faith in Christ. But these believers who come to faith during the tribulation will experience a time of unspeakable anguish for their faith and for their witness. Their leaders will beat them. But watch out for yourselves, for they will, they'll deliver you up to councils and you'll be beaten in the synagogues. You'll be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must be first preached to all the nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, he says, don't worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. For whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that. For it is not in you to speak, but the Holy Spirit. And the one of the most amazing tragedies of this experience, Jesus writes, he said, even your loved ones will betray you. How can you imagine that? He says that brother will betray brother to death, and father and his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to put be put to death. And then he adds another part of this whole scenario when he says that this will also be a time of national sorrow. And so we read, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of the house, and let him that is in the field not go back again and to get his clothes, but woe to those who are pregnant, and those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter, for in those days there will be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time nor ever shall be. Then, with all of this going on, Jesus says, talks about a world ruler will come on stage. So much turmoil, so much confusion, looking for an answer, looking for a way out looking for someone that would somehow get them out of this predicament, there will be a world ruler that will come on stage. And this world ruler will solve all of the problems that mankind has ever had, solve the Middle East problem, solve all of the world problems. And then with all of that taking place, he will now order that a, an image of himself will be placed of all places in the temple. Then he will command the world that they worship him as a God. And this is what Jesus calls the abomination of desolation. And following this will bring a time of, you would think, unprecedented peace, a time of calm now. He says, no, something else will take place. Because now, for those who are the believers, unprecedented anguish in the world, so intense in affliction and grief that Jesus said that those in, Ju in Judea had better run to the mountains. He said, in, in effect, if you're out in the field, I tell you, don't go back and gather your clothes. If you're on that roof type, don't go down and try to rescue anything. You've got no time to lose. You've got to get out of Dodge, because if you stay back, going to be hurt. I'm always amazed, you know, when you, when you get on the, air, on, the, on the plane, they always tell you, if there is an emergency, don't take your bags with you, right? If, if the plane, and I'm assuming if the plane crashes, whatever, people who are struggling to get their bags out, probably not a wise idea to do. But in that same sense, you have this kind of imagery here. You've 
got no time to lose. For this person who is called the Antichrist or the world ruler, his whole thing will be to kill those who will not, cannot be, will bow down and worship him. And he will bring upon the earth persecution unheard of, a time of unrelenting sorrow, as he says, has found in no place in any period of history. Now, I tell you, when I read this, I'm saying to myself, hey, wow, God, thank you. That before the rapture takes place, I'll be taken out. And there, there was this fall, not fall, but this sense of feeling, wow, relieved. Maybe a little bit of glee that when he comes down and I go up, and I'm passing by, and I'm thinking to myself, if I'm reading all of this correctly, that I won't have to experience that. That's a part, for me, that's a lot of selfishness on my part, but humanly speaking, I got to feel, I'm relieved about that. And finally, we have the seeds of the tribulations after that. Jesus said in verse 24, but in those days after that tribulation, because the time of the tribulation does come to an end. I tell you what, if you're going through some tough times, seven years, when you think about it, calculate, whatever it may be, it may be, it may be just a short period of time. But I'll give you an experience, one. I was swimming and I happened to swim right into this wall. I was a teenager, smashed right into this wall and I cracked my tooth here. And so as a result of that, you know, they, the, the root was showing a lot of pain. Oh, and I went to see the doctor right away. And I knew I only had just you know, about eight hours or so before I could see the doctor. But that eight hours seemed like eternity. Seven years when you're going through some difficult things can seem like an eternity. One of the things that will happen is that God will shake his creation to let him know that things are going to change now. Listen to those word, these words. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give up its light, and the stars of heaven will fall, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. When for years it seemed that it, as if Satan was in complete control, suddenly God takes everything, shakes it up, in order to let the world that something different is going to take place. He touches the universe and lightning begins to crackle. He touches the universe and the thunder begins to boom. Earthquakes happen, rocks begin to roll, the volcanoes begin to screw up all of his innards. The sun will begin to become as black as midnight and the moon will be burnt out like a light bulb and the stars will fall and God will shake his creation as if never before to say, things are changing right now. Because what happens is something incredible. He brings his Christ now in. And then he says, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth, to the farthest part of heaven. When Jesus came for the first time, he came to redeem you and me. But the next time he came, he came, he came to remove the believers out before the tribulation. And when he comes again, he will come to reign, he will come to bring in with him all those that have trusted him, all those that were taken with him, all those that have suffered for the faith, he will come not only as redeemer, he'll come not only as remover, he'll come finally to be the ruler of our universe and of our world. He will come back in power and glory. The first time he came, there was a cross. There was a crown of thorns put on his head. When he comes back again, there will be a, another kind of crown to indicate that he's now the king. And he will wear that crown and he will be our rule and his, and his reign, according to what I read, will be for a thousand years. In the rapture he took his saints. In the revelation he'll come with his saints. Listen to what God's word says. Now I saw the heaven open and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called 
faithful and true. And his, in his righteousness he judges and he makes war. His eyes are like the flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one know, knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dripped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen and white and clean followed him on a white horse. And now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of fierceness and wrath of God Almighty. And he had on his robe and on his thigh written these words, King of kings and Lord of lords. Let me close by sharing this little illustration with you. And it comes from Jerry Vines. Some of you may know Jerry Vines. He's a, he's a very renowned Southern Baptist leader and also a, a great preacher. And he writes these words concerning what it will be like if Christ rules on this earth. He says, one day all Christians will go to Jerusalem. He says, I will wake up one fair morning. I will stroll down the streets and come to a wagon full of roses. And after reaching in to get a few, I'll notice that there are no thorns on those roses. And I will ask her, where did you get those roses? And she will answer, I grew them in the desert. And I ask, in the desert? Yes, haven't you heard? The Lord reigns in Zion, and the desert shall bloom like a rose. I walk to a pet shop and see a man buying a cobra for his boy. And after a while, he's buying such a poisonous snake for his son, he will answer me. Haven't you heard? The Lord reigns in Zion, and the lion shall eat straw like the lamb. The sucking child shall play upon the hole of the ass. And I will go a little further and ask, where are the policemen? And someone will say to me, there is no need for policemen. The Lord reigns in Zion. They have beat their, their swords into plowshares, and they have turned their spears into pruning hooks, and nations shall not learn war no more. I will visit the hospital because I want to visit the sick and encourage the sick, and someone will say, we don't need any hospitals anymore. The Lord reigns in Zion. The inhabitants of this land will never again say, I'm sick. But what about the home for the cripple? Someone will say, we don't have cripples anymore. The Lord reigns in Zion. What about the home for the mentally ill? What about the home for the physically and emotionally challenged? Well, we don't have those anymore. The Lord reigns in Zion. What about the deaf and the mute? We don't have those anymore. And what about the cemetery? We don't have any of those either. So where do you go to church? I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. And I'm going to worship the great king. I'm going to go into the temple and I'm going to see the Lord lifted high. And I'll hear the great choir in that temple proclaiming and singing these words. All hail the power of Jesus' name. And that's what it's going to be like when Jesus comes again. The amazing thing about this whole thing Regardless of where I stand in my life, one thing is absolutely certain, that Christ will come. He will come again, and He will come as a ruler. He will come to, to put peace finally back into our world. But He will put, put peace back into our world under His condition, under what He has already planned for us. The other amazing thing is, while I may take comfort in the fact that I may be taken with it, I cannot be comforted in this other fact that there are many people that will be suffering because they don't know the Lord, because they have not called upon Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. There is no plea in that for me. All I can say at this point is, how do I then acknowledge the one thing, the 
one major command that Jesus gave to me, and that is to make disciples, to baptize those, that they may come to know Jesus Christ, and that they might be spared of all the things that is described here. Those are very powerful words here. I'm not comfortable with those words, but I'll say to you, they also say to me, I don't, well, I don't know the time. I know that the present time that I have right now is to do all that I can, regardless of the reactions I receive, to let people know that the time for you to make a decision for the Lord is near. Not simply because I would like to add more people into the congregation, but simply because I don't want you to experience what could be experienced here. Now, here it is for you. For those of you that know Christ as your Lord and Savior, thank God for that. Praise God for that. For those of you that don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would like to offer you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ right now. To ask Him to come into your heart. He stands at the door, as He says, and knocks, and He says, If any man will open that door, let me come in, He will live with Him from this day forward. That all sins, the life that He's promised you, will be given to us. And so with that, uh, we offer that to you, only because that's what Christ wants. If you've not been baptized, you've not followed Christ in full obedience to Him, we'd like to offer that as well, that you might be baptized in His name. And finally this, for those that are, of you that are looking for a place to serve the Lord, here is a place that you say, here I can be a part of this disciple-making effort to reach our community and the world for you. Whatever God is leading you to do this morning, as we sing our, our song of response, we're going to ask you, if the Spirit of God is leading you, that you might come and hear Him and respond. Please stand.